Welcome back, folks, to another exciting JLAN bio video. I am here today to finish up our kinetics unit. That's right, we're going to be done. It happened so fast. We started and then we finished. I guess that's how most things happen. You start and then you finish, because if you finish something and then you started it, it would be backwards and that's wrong. Uh, we're going to finish up today over reaction order and rate law. So we're going to be looking at mathematical concepts related to um, speeds of reactions and how they take place. Okay. A little bit more complex material, something that you guys have never seen before, but um, follow along with the video. We'll go over it in class, and I'm sure you guys will do just fine. Let's talk a little bit about the learning objectives for today. Hopefully, by the end of this video, you will be able to solve a variety of factors involving reaction rates and rate laws. And you should also be able to write rate laws based on three key ideas or concepts. Now, we have quite a few vocabulary terms for this part of the unit. We're going to be looking at rate law, reaction order, experimental rate law, rate determining step, reaction intermediate, and again, the term catalyst. Woo. No. Uh, just a quick reminder, everybody, before we start our unit, that this particular video is sponsored by Big K Diet Cola. That's right, Big K Diet Cola. All the taste, less calories. Big K Diet Cola. Ah, refreshing. All right, let's talk a little bit about rate law. So, previously we've looked about, uh, we've talked about what factors influence the rate of a reaction. We know that temperature influences the rate of reaction. The addition of a catalyst influences. Uh, the rate of a reaction. Concentration influences it. And that's what we're really going to focus on today is concentration. By increasing concentrations, they play a role in the speed of a reaction. The more concentration is present, the more collisions that happen, and therefore the faster the reaction takes place. Now, we can mathematically determine this by using what is called a rate law. This is different for each reaction. So if we take a look here, we can take a look at the rate and understand that that times K times the concentration of our reactants actually tells us a really, really important part. It tells us the rate of our reaction. So the rate laws there on the right, we're going to learn not only to be able to uh, develop, but we'll also be able to solve. Uh, because if we know the concentrations of NO and O2, and we know K, we can solve for the rate. So how do we write rate laws? Well, Rate laws are equal to the reaction rate, and that is set equal to K, which is a constant value, times the concentration of A to the X power, times the concentration of B to the Y power. This is where rate is in meters per second. K is the rate constant, so if the rate constant is large, then it will be a very quick reaction. If the K value is small, it will be a very slow reaction. A and B are concentrations of the reactions, uh, reactants, and those will typically be given to you in molarity. You may notice the powers of X and Y there, and that is the order of the reaction. Now, it's fairly easy to figure this out because the order of the reaction uh, is given to you by the coefficients of your balanced chemical equation for simple reactions, okay? So we'll take a look at an example here in just a moment. So in steps in determining the rate law, for simple equations, we just write out the chemical species for A and B. We put them in brackets because that represents concentration. And then the coefficients of each become exponents. So the example here, we have 2NO plus O2 yields 2NO. Well, the reaction rate, the rate itself is determined by how quickly the reactants are then converted into products. So the rate of this is equal to just my reactants. So we have the rate equals K times the concentration of NO times the concentration of O2. Now, because there is a coefficient of 2 in front of NO, then it becomes NO squared. We say that the rate of NO is second order because it is to the second power. The rate of oxygen is to the first order because it is first uh, to the first power. The total rate of the reaction is said to be in third order. When we find the total rate of the reaction, uh, we add them together. So we just say that it is third order. Okay? It's pretty straightforward on how to write these. But also keep in mind that we can use numerical data, plug into this expression, and be able to solve for either rate or K given a variety of different variables. Let's do a practice problem together. All right, so looking at this practice problem, it's pretty straightforward. We're just going to write out the rate law for the following. So, yay, my stylus works. Wasn't working earlier. Pretty excited about that. Okay, so we have our three reactants here. So we're just going to simply say that the rate, which is spelled R-A-T-E, is equal, okay? And we're going to put the concentration of our reactants in brackets. So H2O2. We've got I minus... H plus. Okay. 
Now keep in mind that the coefficients become exponents, so 3 here is going to go with the i. H plus is going to have 2 there. Okay. So assume that this reaction happens much faster than the previous. So what does that say about k? Well, in order for the rate to increase, k has to be a very high value. So that's going to say that k, our rate constant, is going to be very high. The faster the reaction, the higher k. If the reaction happened much faster than the previous, what does that say about activation energy? Well, we know that fast reactions have a lower activation energy. So as a result, activation energy is going to be lower, okay? So pretty straightforward in how to write these. Now, most reactions we will not be able to do this with. We're going to have to look at some thermodynamic and kinetic data in order to be able to determine the rate of the reaction. How do we do that? Let's find out in part two. So the first method is great when we're utilizing very simple reactions, but a lot of times um, the first reaction actually doesn't work as well as we want to, um, simply because it doesn't actually tell us the true rate law. So we have to use experimental data to determine the reaction order or the exponent of each component. So this is done by running multiple reactions to determine the reaction rate. And we change the concentrations of each reactant to see how the reaction actually changes. We then compare the data and that actually tells us some really useful information about the reaction order as it takes place. You'll see what I mean here in just a moment. So this is the same set of slides that we looked at previously, but we're just going to analyze this a little bit deeper, okay? So what we need to do is we need to look at um, different experiments and look at where we only changed one of the concentrations. So let's look at one and two. One and two is going to be a perfect example to be able to look at this, okay? So in one and two, uh, B and C actually stay the same. Okay. But A changes. Notice what happens to the concentration of A. The concentration of A doubles, right? Goes up by a factor of 2. Well, the next thing we need to look at is what happens to the rate as it doubles. And in this instance, we take a look here, and the rate also doubles. Okay. So if both of those two things are the same, then what we say is that A here is going to be first order. Okay. Pretty straightforward on how to do that. Let's take a look at a few more examples. Let's look at 1 and 3. A stays the same. B doubles, but C stays the same. Well, what happens to the reaction rates there? Well, if B goes up by a factor of 2, this here actually stays the same. Notice that the reaction rate is the same as what it was previously. So we would actually not include that in the reaction rate. We would say that B has a reaction order of 0, and therefore we don't include that because as B concentration doubles, the rate of the reaction actually stays the same. So you kind of get the idea here of how we're going to take a look at some of these things in order to determine the rates of reaction and determine uh, the uh, reaction order for each individual component of the reaction. We look at that thermodynamic or that kinetic data, and that tells us a lot of very, very useful information. So again, we need to compare experiments where we only change one variable. Let's look at again here at this set of data here and look at 1 and 2. When we compare uh, 1 and 2, we notice that O stays the same, but NO doubles. Well, if NO doubles, let's look at what happens to the rate forming NO2. The rate forming NO2 actually quadruples. So if the amount of um, material doubles and the rate quadruples, that tells us that the order for NO is actually 2, so the exponent will be 2. Okay. And if we look at the same thing for 1 and 3, we compare 1 and 3. Oxygen doubles in 1 and 3 from 0 0.015 to 0 0.30. The rate doubles as well. So again, just like before, that tells us that the reaction order is 1. All right? Let's do a practice problem together. So the first question asks, what is the reaction rate for the following data? We want to know the rate law. And then we also want to determine the uh, value for the rate law constant. So let's do our rate law first. Okay. So in this instance, we've got rate. And we're looking at our two um, reactants here. So we're looking at NO and H2. Well, the next thing we need to do is look at our kinetic data. So again, let's take a look here and see what changes. Um, well, for the first two experiments here, we're going to look at uh, NO does not change. So there's no change here. H2 doubles. What happens to the reaction rate is H2 doubles. Well, if we look at the equation here, we notice that it doubles as well. So if H2 doubles and the rate doubles, then we know that H2 has a reaction order of 1. Now, you don't need to write that. I'm just writing it to prove a point here to make sure that you understand what's going on. We need to compare one where uh, NO changes, but H2 does it. So that's going to be 1 and 3. 
NO goes from 0.10 to 0.20. Here we go from 1.23 to 4.92. So what that tells us is that as the concentration of NO doubles, the rate goes up by a factor of four. So that tells us that the order of NO is squared. Okay? So there's your reaction rate right there. And then we're just going to multiply that by K, which is our constant value. Okay. So again, pretty straightforward on how to go through and write these out, but also notice that this is not equivalent to what we saw earlier with the reaction. Okay, so if you are given kinetic data, you need to utilize that. Now the next question says, what is the value for K? Well, we can just take numbers from any one of these three experiments and plug that in. So what we can say here is, let's just use the initial rate for the first one. So 1.23 times 10 to the negative third equals K, concentration of NO is 0 0.10. We're going to square that times 0 0.10. So if we look for the, for the value for K is 1.23. Okay, And we'll talk more about how that uh, K value comes into play a little bit later on. But again, pretty straightforward in how to go through and calculate this. The last way that we can determine the rate law and reaction order is if we know the reaction mechanism for a particular reaction. Do keep in mind and remember that the reaction mechanism must balance and cancel to become a balanced chemical equation. Let's take a look at an example of that just to remind us of how reaction mechanisms and the total overall chemical reaction are directly related. So this question just simply asks us to determine the balanced chemical equation from the following. And we're given our slow reaction here and our fast reaction, which we'll talk more about in just a moment. But remember, like terms on the same side, you can add them together. Like terms on the product side of one and the reactant side of another can cancel. Okay, so the first thing you want to look at is anything that can cancel here. And if we look, we have an AB in our product side and an AB in our reactant side. So all we're going to simply do here is add like terms, just like this. And that gives us our full balanced chemical equation. All right. So again, pretty straightforward on how to go through and do that. Um, so notice in the previous equation, we had a slow step and a fast step. So this is the final way that we can go through and determine our rate law. When we're looking at these two steps, and you think about it, the slow step is always the step that is going to be rate determining. And that kind of makes sense because you heard the, the phrase like the, the slowest person in your, it's like a military saying that you're only as fast as the slowest person in your group. Well, it's the same way with reactions. Our reaction is only as fast as our slowest step. Okay, so the same concept applies here. If our first step is slow, then the rate of the reaction is simply determined by the reaction to the first step. Okay, so we don't even look at that second step because it's fast. It's going to happen very, very quickly when compared to our first step. So for this, we would just say that rate is equal to K. And since we're looking at that first step, concentration of A times concentration of B. And that's it. Okay. There's no exponents there, so we don't worry about it. Bam, we're done. That's all you have to do here, okay? Very, very easy and very straightforward to go through and complete that. It gets a little bit trickier when the second step is slow. We'll see that here in just a moment. So if we have a slow second step, the process is a little bit trickier. We still use the slow step as the rate determining step. So in this instance right here, we're going to look here and see that our slow step is the second step, so we're going to utilize these as part of our reaction here, okay? So what we would say is that rate... equal to K times the concentration of B times the concentration of B. Now there's a problem with this. Notice we don't have a, a, a D in any part of the beginning part of the reaction here. So any intermediates that are found in the second step are replaced by the reaction to the first step. If you think about this, this first part of the reaction happens so quickly that practically A and B Concentration can be the same as D concentrations, just simply because of how quickly the reaction takes place. So in this instance, because the second step is slow, the first step is fast, and we cannot have intermediates in our rate law, we're going to just simply replace D with A times B. So notice that we have one A and two Bs, and that's when we get our total rate law here. Okay? So again, it's kind of the same concepts here. Two Bs would be B squared. Um, the only difference here is with our slow second step, any intermediates that are the reactants of our first step and products of our, I'm sorry, reactants of our second step and products of our first step can be replaced by the reactants of the first step. Let's do one more practice problem just to make sure we're good. 
pretty straightforward here. We're just asked to determine the rate law for the following. Okay, so we notice we have a slow second step. So let's go ahead and just kind of start by writing that out. Rate law equals k, and it's n two o two dr two. Now, because of that slow second step, uh, we need to look to see if there are inter any any intermediates, and there are. This is an intermediate right here. Okay. So remember what we talked about, any intermediate that's here, we can utilize the reactants of that first step to replace the intermediate. Because remember, we cannot have intermediates in our rate law. So our rate here is going to change, and we're going to include our two reactants from our first step. Now because they're both NO, we can square it and multiply that by dr. All right? Again, and, and you're done. So the rates are very, very easy to determine here. And again, I can give you experimental data here, and you could plug in and solve for K or solve for rate as you see fit. All right, let's move on. All right, guys, that's all I had. Pretty straightforward here. Just make sure that you guys are able to solve for a variety of factors involving rates and rate laws, and then also be able to write rate laws based on three key ideas or concepts that we talked about, okay? End of our uh, kinetics unit. So hopefully by the end of this, you know how to write out rate laws, and we'll move on to equilibrium here in just a couple days, all right? Have a great day, guys. We will talk to you later. Bye-bye.